Perfect. So welcome everyone to our second class of the day here at our February 2021 Washington All Mission Academy. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us for our first class. Now uh, today we're going to be starting with our second class. We're going to be talking about completing your staff applications for cadets. So how to write a really good resume and cover letter and preparing you to be a really good applicant for all of the different staff applications that you're going to be doing later on in your cadet career. Here today to present, we have uh, Cadet Major Tatiana Sparks and Cadet Second Lieutenant Noah Booz. Um, I'm also here. I'm the Cadet Commander, Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Bradley Gorham. So um, we have some really good class and some really good information for you here today. And uh, without anything else, uh, I'll turn it over to our cadet instructors to talk about uh, completing really good cadet staff applications. Thank you, Colonel Gorham. I'm going to go ahead and start by introducing myself. I'm Cadet Major Sparks. And a little bit about me, I've been in CAP exactly five years as of a couple days ago. I have held various staff positions and I have completed many staff applications over the course of my years. And recently I've transitioned to kind of helping people with staff interviews and staff applications. I've commanded two activities and I was planning on commanding a third before it got canceled due to COVID. So I've looked over various staff applications and I know what kind of constitutes a good one versus a bad one. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to my co-instructor. He'll give you an introduction, and then he's going to go ahead and start talking about cover letters. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Cadet Second Lieutenant Noah Boos, and I've been in CAP for about three years now. And as far as staff, I get to be the group CAC recorder and do some of things that involve writing for Civil Air Patrol. So that's always fun. And I'm going to be working on cover letters for you guys today, and I've gotten to look at quite a few cover letters and sit on review boards and run staff interviews that kind of thing so i hope to be able to have some relative experience to share with you guys today so without further ado i'm going to share my screen there how are we doing do you guys see the start zoom thing oh no you don't we see something else that's that's good you see a PowerPoint presentation. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Awesome, thank you. All right, just as a little overview of the entire class session for today, I'm gonna to start by talking about cover letters. Then we're gonna to move to some information from Major Sparks about resumes and staff interviews. And then we have guest speaker, uh, Cadet Captain Cobb. He's gonna to talk to us a little bit about encamp specific applications, you know, what to throw on there and whatnot. Um, since you look really great for staffing those events. So right as we launch in, I just want to clarify our classroom expectations for you guys. We will let you know when you can ask questions. And, and then it's okay to unmute and talk to us when we specify. Other than that, please keep the mics muted. The chat, please keep it on topic. Whoever is not presenting will be monitoring the chat. So if there's any questions there, they may get answered, but I cannot guarantee that. All right, without further ado, launching right in. So who here, just out of curiosity from show of hands, has wanted to or had to apply for staff for some event or a job even? Well, I know Colonel Gorham has, so that's, that's good to know. All right, so we've got some first timers too. Okay, outstanding. So, just to overview the cover letters class that I'm going to be going on, we're going to talk about specific purposes, structure, formatting, and then actually what you're going to put inside it, you know, what experiences to highlight, what not, and then go into a little bit of your language and writing use. And this language and writing is why I love cover letters over resumes. So first of all, the purpose specific to cover letters as, as a hook for your resume, you want them to go read your other documents. They're like, I loved that cover letter. Let me go. What does the resume have to say about them? What is there? If you had to write a vision document, I know some higher up positions require that. Those kind of things. It makes them want to visit you for an interview. And it also proves that you've already been willing to put time into this position. You sat down, you wrote a quality cover letter they're like, this guy's going to spend time doing what I ask him to do. It's also going to be very specific to your position. I know some of us just like 
have a resume template that has everything on it and we just go through and change it slightly for each position you write a brand new cover letter for everything and it's going to be very targeted at something you're going to say which positions you want well which position i would make one per position even if you're applying for several all right i want to talk about format before we talk about everything else just so you guys can organize the information as we go so you see that this person's going to have their name right at the top you're going to have the date on the right and name on the left and if you want your contact information right underneath that this should be your email and if you'd like to put your phone number that's up to you we do not require it um, and it is a, sometimes a security issue so take that into consideration when you do that you don't need to put your address don't put your address we don't need your address if we actually do then we have other ways that are very secure of getting that it's on file then we're going to go into your address your salutation is what you technical term for it is and that's your dear captain major whatever such and such and then your body that's two to three paragraphs of the specific content the drawing in the highlighting experiences that kind of thing and then you're going to end with your closing salutation and your name again some people like to put their contact information at the bottom as well i leave that up to you okay as opposed to as the internal construction of the formatting, there's a few things you need to keep in mind. That is font, spacing, and margins. This can make, this is the first impressions element, which uh, Major Sparks is gonna talk about later with staff interviews of a cover letter of a written document. When I pull that thing up, it's gonna be you know a few things. I'm gonna be like, wow, I really like the way they use that font, it's wonderful. Or man, we're going to need to teach them not to use Comic Sans. And that knee-jerk reaction is inevitable. And so you want it to be positive. So try and put yourself in the shoes of Colonel Gorham, Major Wiggs, sorry, Colonel Wiggs, and think, just look at your cover letter for a second critically and be like, wow, I need to work on this. So font size, no smaller than 12. I would strongly suggest 12. It looks natural, it's not blown up. You don't want them to feel like they need glasses to read yours or you're insulting them because they already need glasses to read that. That would be too big or too small, right? And I have beautifully demonstrated multiple font sizes there. Make it all the same. <laughs> if you have the date like two points smaller than everything else, we're gonna be like, wait a minute, that's awkward looking. Uh, don't do that. Make it all the same. You can just highlight the whole thing. Make sure it's right. As far as typeset, I am a strong advocate for Times New Roman. It looks like a very official CAP document. They, If they've been reading other CAP material, it's an easy transition. It looks natural to them. If you find that that's like too hoity-toity looking for you, then go with something like Arial, Caribou Light, those kind of things that are very professional and steer clear of extra ornamented fonts. Don't even do your signature in this goofy, swirly, cursive thing. Leave it in whatever font you chose. I guarantee that it, they, when they look at it and they're, I mean, there's a little part of us all that like is very happy when we see a formatting and font size executed properly. And you want to exploit that. You want to find out exactly what's going to make this person happy and if it's times new roman write it in times new roman it's a really easy thing that helps a lot spacing i would go with the default um, if you don't have that single or 1.5 you don't want this to be more than one page it needs to fit on the page comfortably i would say in our 21st century lifestyle it should fit on the screen adequately um that helps a lot because if we just look over the whole thing, I'm like, I've got time to read this. It's short. So don't make it like you can write in between the lines with a fat marker, but make sure that they're not so close together that you can't read. Make it look natural. Margins. Okay. Afman 33-3307 um, mentions, and I might be wrong on the number there. Sorry. 
It's the Air Force tongue and quill to make that clear. It mentions the margins need to be one inch. I wouldn't stress about making them one inch exactly, but like I said earlier, if somebody like me is reading your resume and, or cover letter and I'm like, they've got one inch margins, they read aft, they read tongue and quill. That's awesome. Okay, I'm that little part of me is happy about that. So make your margins look natural. All right, the structure of the content. We talked about this overall format. Inside of the thing, we're going to have the hook for the hook. That's like the first sentence, first paragraph. It's going to introduce you, your position that you want, and it's going to be a little mini exposition of your writing talent, like your ability to draw an audience in. Remember the three purposes of writing or speech giving, I should say. You want to entertain, inform, and explain or persuade. This is just a mini like, I can do this. Let me draw you into my cover letter. Now, you don't need to tell jokes in your introduction, but you do need to write it adequately so that we like it. Now, in the body of the thing, which is two to three paragraphs, no longer, do not want this to be more than one page document you highlight your experience. This is the kind of thing that you can't put on a resume. And I'll get into that more in a minute. And then in the end, you want again, hook back to your introduction. So try and use a few keywords that correlate, not exactly, but do correlate. And then express your willingness to meet. Air Force Tongue and Quill recommends that you assume that you're going to get a meeting. I discourage that in Civil Air Patrol because it is a volunteer organization. We don't actually hire people to hire people, you know? So mention, I'd be happy to meet with you to discuss this position further. Thank you very much. Make sure you thank the person at the end. All right, within that structure, the content structure, there's a few things you need to keep in mind. If at all possible, address your letter to a specific individual. If you can get this information, like if it's not provided and you can get it, that's outstanding. If you still can't, then you should probably address it to whom it may concern. It looks professional and it basically shows that I still care who this is going to. Um, you shouldn't have something ambiguous, more ambiguous than to whom it may concern. I would steer clear of other salutation addresses. So for encampment, for example, I would address my letter to the encampment commander. That's what I would do. All right, next you're gonna announce in that first paragraph, right? In the hook, you need to make sure you tell them what position you're applying for. Be clear up front. And so I would like to be a flight commander for encampment, for example. I would love to serve at the Cascade Falcon 20 something encampment as a flight commander, right? Tell them what you want early so they can be measuring the rest of your experience against the ruler they have in their head for that position. Okay, now I use the word soft experience skills in this next one. Soft experience skills are the numbers and the letters qualifications that don't exist. Like there aren't specific, you got qualification 22- whatever. This is, I got to do this position at one point and I had a lot of experience in the administrative side of it. So I would be a great cutout for administrative cadet because I've gotten the work so extensively in this field. It's not a specific item that you can put on your one-on-one -on -one card, but it is very relevant to the position. All right, and like we mentioned earlier, you need to say that you're happy to be you're willing to contribute time to this position is basically what that says to the person. My favorite part, too long in coming, is the writing style. Uh, this is where you can make it even more personal and show off your ability to write well. So the overall tone should be very positive. If you are highlighting what struggles you intend to overcome in this position, we're probably going to raise our eyebrows at you. We know there's going to be struggles and we will ask those questions in the staff interview if you get one. You don't need to talk about that here. You also want to make sure to use strong verbs. I, as a writer, love strong verbs. And by that, I mean don't use good, bad, use great or terrible. 
I always steer clear of terrible because that has a bit of a negative connotation. But you need things that reach out and grab the reader. And I like strong verbs to do that. They're easy. They're not run of the mill. You can introduce lots of variety. So that's what I have to say about that. Once again, this is very personal. Next, being professional. The whole thing should, you shouldn't include, for example, um, the, the contraction words, you know, that you connect with a hyphen. Don't, do not. Write out the do not. It just feels more professional, less conversational. I don't mind if you talk in, like that in a staff interview. Don't is fine, but do not should be spelled out, those kind of things. Also identify your acronyms. So if you use, I would write out Civil Air Patrol even, and then in parentheses, CAP. That's how it's traditionally done. If you're going to use an acronym for the rest of your writing, write out the acronym, and then in parentheses after it, put what it may, put how you're going to abbreviate it later on. All right, now we are going to jump into some examples. And I'm going to ask you guys, two or three of you, to tell me what's great about this example and what might be not so good about this example. It's loading. You guys should see like a white screen. So let me know if you guys can see it. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Awesome. Just going to give you guys about 30 seconds to look at this, and then we're going to talk about it. All right, so I'm going to pick on specific people. Sergeant Bellino, what do you like about this cover letter? Uh, the way he describes <clears throat> what he has observed at Arlington flying. All right, good. So highlighting those soft experience skills that we talked about, like you can't just like, it's not a, one one card thing. I talk to people at Arlington Flying, but it is valuable. All right, one more person. Um, Senior Master Sergeant, sorry, no, Senior Airman. Um, have trouble with the last name, so I'm looking at my rest. Um, class register over here. Santis, sorry, it cut it off. Nathan. Yes, it is Santa Stephen, if you're wondering. Thank you. Um, it's very to the point and uh, easy to read. Awesome. I like that. That's good feedback. Does anybody not like anything about this? I don't know if I don't like it, but I'm confused about the LinkedIn profile. Fair. And I didn't talk about that because I don't have one. And honestly, that's about as much as I know about it that I don't have one. So that's what I would say. I mean, from the people that I've talked to and the examples that I've been given, if you do have one, you can put it on there. So it's it's in brackets to say that you could do it if you want. All right, awesome. Let's go back to this and look at the next example. All right, I think that's long enough for you guys to have to look at that. So Lieutenant Roberts, 
how many things would you change about this particular cover um, letter? First, uh, they were very negative in their writing. Uh, they were like, it'd be funny if I messed up because I don't have enough experience. That was very different than the other one who spoke about what they were good at. Uh, that'd probably be something to speak about in their interview. Um, he didn't even give them a chance to ask them for a meeting. He just said, I'll call you next Wednesday. And so I, and then he also said, dear people, and he didn't even, and in his sincerely, he just said, Joe. So that's what I found wrong immediately. And it was really there. It didn't really cover the whole page. It was a very brief uh, cover letter. Thank you. Can anybody tell me something that is positive about this cover letter? He clearly states what he's applying for and he keeps things pretty short, which on one hand is nice because you don't need to read through like a chunk of text, but on the other hand, it's like, uh, I would like more information, but it could, it could be positive. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, honestly, talking to my fellow officers and sergeants here, if you received a cover letter like this, uh, start with the, what went well and then move on to how we can improve. It can't happen, just saying. So be prepared. I would like to note something that I forgot to mention earlier. Um, this up here, the date. Between the two, uh, this one has the numerical day of the month, the month spelled out, and then the full year. That is, what I would consider conventional within Civil Air Patrol, that's how we write dates on official memorandums and things. So I would highly recommend including that because once again, it makes people like me and other people who have to write officially very happy to see that you took the time to discover how that was supposed to be done. Any final comments on either of those examples? Let's see if I can make it back to one. Sorry, I muted myself instead of unmuting myself. No, okay, thank you very much. And these are some resources for you guys. AFMAN 33-337, that would be the tongue and quill. I highly recommend you look at this. This is the official writing guide for the Air Force. It's got a lot of valuable things in there as a resource. And if you write it in a beautiful official Air Force format, a lot of people will like you a lot more. And then I'm a resource for you guys. If you ever want me to look over a cover letter or a resume, those kind of things, I would be more than happy to do that anytime. I can't promise I'll get back to you if you get to me the night before it's due, but I'll do my best. And any real could quick that, questions? That, Lieutenant, yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is Major Crozier here. Um, I just had a couple questions about some of these, you know, I've read over the tongue and quill and so forth, but I noticed that on the, on the example that you gave there, um, it had a colon after the deer so-and-so. And, -so. and um, I guess grammatically that probably would be better off as a comma. Now, if you're making a memorandum and an announcement, then you'd do a colon, but um, Correct me if I'm wrong, I, I believe that having a comma after that would be more appropriate if you say dear so-and-so. Sir, um, I'm honestly not going to debate writing technique with you right now. I just you know that personally in my grammar and school experience, uh, I have been taught that I can use a colon when it's a very official something. And I, I mean, I consider that I, I definitely wouldn't dock you if you use the comma. And to be honest, I'm a little unclear on the colon i know it's not great to say but so if you i would i would not dock you for putting either on there um you might want to research that i will research that and if you'd like i'll get back to you see what i find you might very well be right was that on the poor example or the the first one that was the better example i believe it was on the better example 
Yeah, actually, it's on both. But yeah, and I'm I'm not trying to uh, pimp you or question you. I I just just a comment, just a friendly comment. Um, for concise writing. I noticed on the first example, also the first sentence after the first sentence, there was a semicolon and then a second sentence. So, I mean, there's just very, very minor grammatical issues with that. Um, but just something to keep an eye out for. I really like the second example in that, I guess one of the things, even though there was a lot of things that you could correct, the second example actually could be an opportunity uh, for teaching a cadet um, how, how to write up the letters. So that's, I guess that's one positive thing about it. And if it was a senior member looking at that second example, I would think, oh, this is uh, you know, a fairly humble cadet that's very teachable because he can uh, see his um, but Just a couple of thoughts. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, sir. Those are all valuable thoughts. On the semicolon thing, it is a grammatical niche. I am into grammatical niches, and uh, you can put two sentences together with a semicolon as long as they're both two complete sentences without the use of a conjunction word. This is Colonel Weber. I was just going to add something. Um, traditionally, when you're writing a business letter, um, the colon is used if it's what they call a friendly letter or an informal letter, then a comma is used. But <clears throat> that's the way I was taught way back in the 19th century. So thank you all. Like I, I mentioned, those are some you know deep grammatical specifics, yeah. and honestly, it's I like the whole semicolon thing because. I like semicolons. And so if I can, you know, put two relevant sentences together, I probably will. That's my personal writing style. And it's not necessarily a rule that I would recommend to everybody. If you want to make those two complete sentences or you want to connect them with a comma and, and that's fine. Just make sure you don't have a run on sentence. All right. I think, is, I think this shows a really, it really demonstrates, like you're saying, knowing who you're writing it to and what might be their you know, things that they really look for and like and don't like. So I think this is a great example of that. Yeah, so thank you all very, very much for the comments. Um, if there are no more quick ones, then I will turn it over to my colleague, Major Sparks. Thank you, Lieutenant. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, and we're going to talk about resumes and cover letters. So hang on, it's loading. Can everyone see my PowerPoint? I don't know if it's going to go to the beginning. Can everyone see it? For some reason, we're on the wrong slide. All right. Resume. All right, can everyone see that? Thumbs up, thumbs down? All right, we got thumbs up. All right, so today I'm going to go over resumes first, and then I'm going to move into staff interviews. I have had quite a bit of experience with resumes. I grew up with a mother who worked for Job Corps, and her job was actually to help kids make resumes and cover letters and help them get jobs when they complete the program. So I've learned a lot from her on how to make resumes. And cab resumes are definitely a bit different than job resumes, but they follow a similar format. So classroom expectations are same as before. I just want to reiterate them real quick. Questions. Um, we'll have time for them near the end, so please save them until then. Please keep your mics muted while I'm talking. The background noise can cause some issues and can cause some bandwidth issues for presentation. And please keep the chat on topic. Again, my co-instructor will be monitoring it and we'll try to get to questions if we can, but we can't promise if you put it in the chat, we'll get to it. All right, overview. What is the purpose of a resume? A resume's purpose, is to kind of give the more factual um, experience that you have. So in your cover letter, you're gonna talk about your soft skills. In your resume, you're gonna talk about what are the hard skills, and I'll go over those later. Then we're gonna talk about the format, the content, and kind of the difference between resumes and cover letters, because that's not always clear. So the specific purpose, again, as I mentioned, you're gonna highlight your hard skills. So you detail out your experience, provide some proficiencies, and show exactly why you're qualified for such a position that you're applying for. And experience is going to be not only positions you've held or jobs you've done, but 
also trainings you've completed, um, any ES qualifications you have, have you done your food handlers permit, stuff like that, that may apply to the position you're applying for. And then you can provide your proficiencies as well. Those are gonna be kind of like those classes you've done or stuff such as having, you know, if you're applying for Desert Eagle, you might wanna put on there that you have your student pilot license, something like that would be under the proficiencies tab. So format, we're gonna go through kind of the slide and then I'm gonna show you an example. So at the very top, and I prefer it centered, some people like to put it on the left-hand side of the page, you want your name followed by your grade and your squadron and then your contact information. Then you're gonna go into experience. Education is optional. I put it on there because I tend to add it. Your achievements, your proficiencies, and then any additional stuff. And then on the far right-hand side, you'll see I put dates for experience and education. You wanna put dates on there. So let's launch into this sample resume. I'll see if I can get it up. It is going to be loading, hopefully here shortly. All right, so this is gonna be my sample and I'll talk to you guys through it real quick. So this is kind of a resume I created. I took four different resumes and put them all together to make this one, picking out the best parts of each one. So we've got Cadet Ira Eaker. And as you can see, he's listed, he's a second Lieutenant. He's from Bumptown Composite Squadron. Again, the LinkedIn profile is optional. Some people like to put it on there. If you don't have one, I don't have one. I don't put it on there. Then you're gonna put your phone number if you would like. Phone numbers, again, optional. Email address needs to be on there. I need to have some way of contacting you and email is just the best way. Preferably put your CAP email on there if you're doing a CAP resume. And if you have a CAP email, put it on there. And then address is a no, don't put your address on there. And then your first one wants to be your experience. This is the biggest and most important one that we're gonna look at. So that's why you want it at the top. And you wanna list your experience in order of most recent to least recent. So see here at the top, his first, his most recent one is Alpha Flight Commander. And it started October, 2020, and he's still holding the position. And so you'll see that he goes on and he adds a little bit of a list of what each position is. This is something, some people argue whether you should have it on there or not. I prefer it because for instance, I've applied for positions at Region, and when they look at a cover letter from, you know, for me from Region, they're going to look at it and be like, what in the world is Project Appleseed? Because they don't know what that is at Region. So I can list, you know, it was a marksmanship academy, and that way they can be like, like oh, okay, I know what that is now. So yeah, just a short little, you know, kind of explanation of what it is. And then next is going to be education. This is actually an optional category. I prefer to put it on there. Some people don't. Um, if you don't have a lot on your resume, it might be worth throwing on there to take up some space. Um, they have the name of their high school, the dates that they've been attending, and then they have their GPA. Um, a little bit of research I did found that you shouldn't list your GPA. There's a couple different experts who weigh in on it, but they believe if it's lower than a 3.5, don't put it on there. So only put your GPA on there if it's higher than a 3.5. Achievements. So these are going to be awards you've received in CAP, that sort of idea, or awards outside of CAP if you choose to include them. So in this case, he's listed the Air Force Sergeants Association, Cadet NC of the Year, Quarter for BCS Cadet of the Quarter, and then his best uniform award. I would also say that depending on what the resume is for, you may want to put explanations of these two, because sometimes they may not be able to tell what these awards are. In this case, it wasn't needed, but that's something you may want to include. And last is proficiencies. These are going to be kind of more of soft skills, like what was in your cover letter, but these are going to be very, very quick and brief. So in this case, he's got one, inspiring cadets to excellence through integrity focused leadership. And what these statements are is there are sentence fragments, but they're kind of just, you're going to power pack certain words into them to make them appealing. So for instance, this section I included from an AFI or an AFI cover that I received or an Arlington fly and one I received. And I emphasized integrity when I sent out the application procedures. And so he made sure to include the integrity in his resume so that he could kind of show that he was paying attention and he was following the prompts and he knew what things I was looking for. So if you do get like a little application packet explaining how to do the application, read through it, notice if they're using keywords such as integrity or excellence or that sort of idea and use them in your cover letter resume because it shows that you paid attention and you read it. So that's kind of the general format. You can add additional stuff 
that you've done outside of CAF if your resume is not very long so that you have enough stuff because you want to fill a full page or at least I'd say at least three quarters of a page. You want this to take up quite a bit of space, but you don't want to go over a page. And when you're first starting CAP, I know my first resume only had Element Leader on it because it was the only thing I'd done. And so I had to bulk it up and throw on some stuff I've done outside CAP in order to make it have enough stuff to fill three quarters of a page. And that's where you can list school activities or sports or that sort of idea. The thing to know about that is you want to keep it stuff that's still relevant. So for instance, you know, sports shows that you're physically fit, or if you've been on student government, that shows leadership, but you also want to show commitment. So if you've just bounced back and forth between this or that from, you know, I've done student government for a month, and then I did, you know, soccer for a month, that might not be your best thing to put on there because it shows you don't really have a good commitment level. But if you can say, oh, I did soccer for five years. That not only shows you're physically fit, but it shows you're willing to commit to something such as a sport that takes a long time. Um, a couple more formatting things, no pictures. Do not put pictures on your resume. I've seen this one too many times. I don't need a picture of you. Um, don't put any personal identifying information other than what's here at the top, your name and your email and maybe your cell phone. I don't need to know you know, specific details about you that opens up for discrimination. That's something we do not want in CAP. So leave off anything that might identify you in that sort of way. Again, as I mentioned, a page maximum, unless otherwise stated, I did one for a region that they had a two page maximum. So that gives you more room to expand, but try and keep it a page max and try and fill at least three quarters of a page. Don't make anything up. This is actually on the rise according to experts. More and more and more people are just making up experience. Don't do this. We will catch it. We will find it out. Um, I did actually have a cadet apply for an activity one time claiming to have qualifications, and then I went onto e-services and they weren't there. And so we will find out, and it is not a pleasant conversation when we have to have it and tell them that they obviously did not show integrity. Keep it consistent. Don't change your formatting up throughout the whole thing. I'm gonna show another example that will kind of give a good idea of how why you want consistency. And last but certainly not least, some people like to include references in their resume. That's not one of my things. I'm not huge into that. But if you do include a reference, make sure you talk to them first. It's always horrible to list a reference and then they get called and they're like, um, oh yeah, I remember them. And then they give you a very, very bad review and you're stuck having to cover for it. Um, so if you do, do not make sure you tell them so that you know that it's going to be a good reference. All right, we'll move back into the PowerPoint for a little bit, and then we're going to jump to one last example, and I'm going to have you guys kind of weigh in on the next example. All right, nuts and bolts. Again, kind of font size. Um, keep it a good size. I mean, 12-point font is good. Or you can make it, I mean, I could say if you have a lot of stuff on there, 11 might be I'd say that's the minimum you want to go is 11. Don't go any smaller than that or they ain't going to be able to read it. Font type. Again, I also love Times New Roman. Keep it Times New Roman. I put Comic Sans over here. Please don't use Comic Sans. It doesn't look good. It's so hard to read and it's a waste of time. And I, it's, it's kind of mean, but if I saw Comic Sans on a resume, I would set it aside and I would be like, nope, they are not getting the position because you do not want to use Comic Sans. Um, spacing, keep your spacing reasonable. As you can see on the far or the bottom right hand side, I put some letters that are very far spaced apart. This is a bit extreme, but you get the idea. You don't want your letters very, very far apart and you don't want them very, very close to the point they're on top of each other and I can't read them. So keep your um, spacing and your letter size reasonable. And margins, as my co-instructor mentioned, you wanna keep your margins at about an inch on all sides of the page. Again, doesn't have to be exactly an inch, but I should be able to look at it and go, oh, those are reasonable margins. I shouldn't be looking at it and your stuff is all squeezed out to the very far edges of the page. Or even the alternative, there's huge gaps at the top or bottom or sides. I've seen huge gaps at the top before, and that's just wasting space that you could use to list more stuff that you've done. So definitely keep those reasonable. All right. Content, we've covered this a little bit, but I'm going to go a little more in detail now. Contact info, again, email for sure. Cap email if you have it. Um, if not, keep it a professional email. So such as, you know, tatiana.sparks at yahoo.com or whatever you're using. 
don't have some weird email address. I've seen a few of those. Those aren't your best option. Phone number is optional. Some people prefer to include it. Some people don't prefer to include it. That's a personal preference thing. Don't include your address. And if you do have a LinkedIn, I'd say you could include that if you want to. Don't include any other social media. Don't include your Facebook. Don't include your Instagram. None of that. Only LinkedIn if you have one and if you want to. Experience. This is going to be listing positions you've held in CAP, or if it's more of a work resume, then you're going to list your job experience. If this is your first time applying for a job, then I'd highly list volunteer experience, such as CAP, because that will give you show that you've had some sort of work experience. Awards. List any awards you've received in CAP. Maybe you've been cadet of the year. Maybe you've gotten a uniform award. Maybe you've gotten an award at an activity. List those awards. That shows us that you've You've done some stuff in CAP that you won an award for. Skills. And skills and proficiencies can kind of go together, so I'm going to do both in one. This is going to be trainings. If you've done any ES trainings, maybe you've done radio communications and you have done your um, introductory communications users training or ICUT. You can list that on there. Maybe you've done general emergency services, GES. You can put that on there. Um, this is also going to be you can list things outside that may apply. So, for instance, Maybe you want to go to an activity and help in the kitchen. Then you're probably going to need a food handler's permit. So list that on there so that we can see that right away. Um, qualifications kind of went over those, that sort of idea. Education is also still optional, but I would include it if you don't have a lost up on your resume. Again, don't include your GPA until unless it's a 3.5 or better. Some people even argue 3.7 or better, but I think 3.5 or better is a comfortable number. Other. So if you don't have a lot of stuff, if you type out all of the stuff I've listed previously and you were only filling half a page because say you're a brand new airman and you've only had one staff position, this is where you want to kind of bulk it up with that stuff I mentioned earlier. Oh, I've been on a sports team for X amount of years. Oh, I played a musical instrument for five years. Oh, I've done that sort of idea where we can see commitment or experience and stuff that will apply in CAP. Dates. Try to put dates on everything if you can experience for sure um, any trainings you've done list when you took the trainings for instance some people will list oh i took first aid and that's all it says well i want to know when you took it so i can know when it expires because they expire after two years that's our idea so list dates on everything if you can't find a date i do my best to guess at it try to get as close as you can and for a resume i would generally only list the month and the year I don't need the exact date that you did something if I can just get a general month and year. So for instance, you know, I was a flight commander from October of 2020 to, you know, January of 2021, or I took my food handler's permit in November of 2019, that sort of idea. All right, we're gonna look at a second example and I'm gonna ask you guys to weigh in on this one. So we'll give this a second to load. And all right. So this resume is actually off is actually based off of one I did receive for an activity. But there are some some things I changed to make it a little bit different than how they originally did it. So you can kind of see parts of it now, it's still loading. Does anyone want to weigh in on any issues they might find with this resume? I'm sure there's at least a couple. Feel free to just type up if you see one or I will start calling on people. Um, the bullet points aren't all the same. Like there's a diamond one at the top and then round ones at the bottom. That is a very good one. And yeah, you want your bullet points to all be the same. So you'll notice in my previous example, I use dashes for the sections where I did bullet points. And I use dashes for all the sections where I use bullet points because I want to keep them consistent. So yes, this is something that does annoy me. Don't use different types of bullet points. Does anyone else see any more issues with this? And I'll scroll down a little bit so you can see the rest of it. Does anyone else see any sort of issues with this 
resume. At the top, they included their address. Yep, at the top, they had their address. You don't want to include that. So that was a good one. Uh, they don't have any dates. Don't have any dates, yes. I believe, is there, yeah, there's some in here, but you're correct. They did not include them in all the places where they needed to. And the dates are kind of hard to spot in this situation. So it makes it very difficult to see. Um, any other ones people see? The experience is really chock full. And I think he could probably take out some things considering that he's going for the cadet deputy commander position, which is probably going to take positions that would be a lot higher um, rather than a Desert Eagle Academy. I don't think that would be necessary for that position. I agree. He did list everything on here. And at this point, this would be when I take off stuff outside of CAP because you've got so much stuff going on in CAP that you don't need stuff outside. So like the musical can come off. I mean, I wouldn't put that on there anyways, but like the playing the cello could come off. The down here, the skiing instructor can come off. You know, I'd maybe list those if you didn't have other stuff. The Mary Poppins musical, I would not list at all because that one doesn't apply and it doesn't make much sense to me to have it on there. And then I'll just cover a few quick other things I've noticed, unless anyone else has something real quick. All right, so a couple other things I want to point out. First off, you put the accent on resume. In a professional setting, don't do that. You don't need that there. Um, he puts an objective. I, I leave objectives as an optional thing. I personally don't like them, but that's just, a, again, a personal opinion. Most of the experts that I've read have said you don't need it unless it's not obvious. So, for instance, if you're applying for the deputy commander position and it's fairly obvious because you put it in your cover letter, you don't need to put it on your resume. Whereas if you're sitting submitting a resume for to a person who's going to be looking over hundreds of positions and you haven't included a cover letter, so they have no idea what the resume is for, that's when you'd want to include it. Um, and especially in the job world, if you're applying for a job, chances are you're going to apply for a very, very specific job. So you're not going to need an objective because they're going to know. Um, we already mentioned bullet points. You can see the formatting is just all over the place. Um, his stuff is just all jam packed together. It's hard to read. There's so much on here. And the other big thing I want to point out is the best flyer award does not exist. That is a made up um, award he got. And so you don't want to put that on there because it's fake. And although some people won't catch that right away, I've been there. I know you can't get that award. So I caught it and it was definitely not something you want to put on there. So back to our PowerPoint. Um, resources. So as mentioned earlier, you have the Air Force Tongue and Quill Manual, 33-337. And then I'm also gonna put myself out there as a resource. I love looking over resumes and cover letters and helping cadets with them. Ask just about any cadet at my squadron. I've helped many of them with resumes and cover letters at least once throughout their career. And generally, if you get it to me three or four days before it's due, I can get it done. You send it to me the day before, chances are it's not happening. I do have other stuff going on. But if you'd like, I would be happy to look over your resume or your cover letter and give you feedback. Are there any quick questions on resumes before I move on to staff interviews? All right, not hearing any, we're going to move on. Staff interviews. This is probably the most fun part of the application from what I've heard from most people. The writing can be pretty difficult and if you struggle with writing, that can be pretty hard. But the interview is a fun thing because it's a more personable thing and you get to actually meet someone and talk to them. Um, it can be pretty nerve wracking. I've been in staff interviews that are pretty nerve wracking, but once you get settled and comfortable, they tend to be pretty fun. And I have been in multiple staff interviews. I've led multiple staff interviews. So I've got quite a bit of experience with this. All right, again, we're gonna go over the purpose of a staff interview, the format of a staff interview, how to prepare for one, and some of my personal tips and tricks to make it go really well.
So the purpose of a staff interview. First of all, it's a purpose to talk over, it's a time to talk over your resume and cover letter. So chances are you said in your cover letter, oh, maybe, you know, I'd love to meet with you. They contacted you, you guys set up a meeting. And now what they want to do is, first of all, they're going to go over your resume and cover letter. Maybe they read something they're not quite clear on. Oh, you put, you had this proficiency. What is that? Or you mentioned that you're skilled in this area. Why do you feel that's true? And this is a time for you to really kind of emphasize the things you put in your resume and cover letter. So if you put something in there like, oh yeah, I have experience with public speaking. They're gonna, maybe they'll ask about it and you can emphasize, oh, I was at this event and I gave a speech on this, or I was at this event and I led a class on this. So read through your resume and cover letter, be really familiar with them and pre be prepared to emphasize on points that you presented in them. It's a good time to ask follow-up questions. Like I mentioned, they can ask follow-up questions on your resume and cover letter. And it's actually a great time for you to ask questions back. So maybe you applied for a job and you don't know much about the company. You did your research online, but you're wondering a very specific thing about the company. This is a great time to ask them, hey, what about this aspect of the company? Or you know, if you're applying for a CAP activity, what about this aspect of the activity? It's a great time to figure out if the situation is a good fit. Sometimes it can be hard to get an assessment of a person through paper. We can get some stuff out of it, but sometimes we want, you know, how, how do they handle certain situations? Um, so that way we can see if it's a good fit for them. And it's a great chance for the parties involved to meet, whether it's virtually like we are now, or it's in person. Format. First things first, you're going to enter the room or the chat or the video call. And this one often gets missed in classes about staff interviews, but I think it's easily one of the most important parts of it. So when you enter, they're gonna make a first impression. Regardless, all of us do it, we can't deny it. And you want that first impression to be a really good first impression. So that's, this is be a great time to dress up. You know, not, you don't wanna be over the top, but if it's a cap one, make sure you're, Uniform looks really good. Press it the night before. Make sure everything's sewn on in the proper place or pinned on in the proper place. Make sure your hair is done neatly, both females and males. I've seen some guys come to interviews with wild hair. You don't want it, that to be your first impression. If it's gonna be in person and they're gonna be able to see your full uniform, make sure you shine your boots, that sort of idea. If it's gonna be more of a job interview and you're not gonna be in your uniform, then you wanna go for what's called business casual, which is gonna be kind of a nice pair of pants, such as slacks and a nice shirt. Something maybe like a button up, something nice. And again, you wanna make sure the clothes are clean and they've been you know, pressed and taken care of. So that sort of idea. Pleasant trees. When you first walk in, there's gonna be this sort of, hello, how are you sort of situation that happens anytime you meet someone. And you want to be, you want to, you know, shake their hand if they offer, introduce yourself. They, they'll probably already know your name, but it's a good time to introduce yourself again. Make sure you know their name. And they may or may not ask you how, they're do, how you're doing. If they ask you, respond and then ask them back. It shows that you're paying attention and that you do actually care how they're doing. Then they'll probably launch into talking over your resume and cover letter. This is just an easy place as an inter someone who's done interviews. It's an easy place to start. And it kind of gets the conversation flowing. So then I can launch into harder topics later. So we'll talk over resume and cover letter, what things you know, look good in it, if I have any questions on further information. And they may or may not give you some feedback on it. If they do, I highly suggest taking notes on it so you can further make your resume and cover letter better for the next one you do. Questions, and these go both ways. The interviewer will ask you questions about stuff and they will always ask you questions. Every interview I've been in, whether I was being interviewed or I interviewed, I asked, I was either asked questions or asked questions. So prepare to be asked questions and I will go over how to prepare for that in another section. And then be prepared to ask questions back. It's actually seen to make you look like a better candidate if you ask questions back. And you wanna make sure these are intelligent questions. Don't just ask stuff that you should already know. Make sure you've done your research, you know about the activity, you know about the position, and then ask questions that you don't know the answers to. Maybe they didn't list something on the website that you think is important. Ask them. 
chances are they may not have noticed and they may actually really appreciate it that you brought it up. Then they'll probably have some further information for you, such as thank you for meeting me. We'll look forward to, you know, we'll send you a response by a certain date or we'll need you to complete a training by a certain date or something along those lines. Um, for instance, I did a job interview fairly recently and when I was done, they gave me a training that I need to complete by a certain date. That would be the further information example. And lastly, a call to action. This is where you want to emphasize that this isn't the end. Some people, I've done an interview before where I'll be like, all right, that's it, you can go, and they'll just leave. That's not how you want to end the interview. You want to thank them for meeting with you. Emphasize on thanking them. You want to make it seem like it was a good thing that they did it and that you're happy that they did it. And then you want to remind them that you expect to hear back from them in some way or another. If they gave you something to do, say thank you for meeting me, I'll make sure to get that done by that date and I'll reach out to you when I'm done. Or if they can see it from their end, you know, I look forward to hearing from you when it's done. Or if they haven't given you anything, um, say you'll look forward from, to hearing from them later. And if you can try to get them to set a date for when you hear from them. And it may be a little while because they have to process some stuff, but generally you want to make sure that you're going to hear back from them and you're not just waiting, hoping that you might hear back from them. How to prepare. As I mentioned previously, dress professionally. I've got a couple pictures here of different ideas of outfits. Nice pants, so no sweatpants, no leggings, preferably not jeans. Um, if they're a really nice pair, maybe, but I'd say slacks. Um, and then a dress shirt, you know, a button up, a nice sweater. You don't have to go full out tuxedo, that's over the top. But you know, you do want to look nice. Make sure your shoes look nice. Don't wear beat up sneakers. And make sure your hair does look nice for both males and females. You know, you want to make sure it's taken care of. If it's a cap thing, you want to make sure it's in regulations. Prepare your cover letter resume. You read it when you wrote it, hopefully. So make sure that you know it well when you get to your staff interview. Make sure you've read it and that you are well aware of what's in it. So if they do say, hey, you know, tell me about this thing, you can be like, oh yeah. When I wrote that, here's what I was talking about. Sample questions. So you wanna practice questions. And the easiest way I found to do this is to simply Google sample interview questions. They'll give you a long list of options and then just start going through them. Some examples may be, give me some of your strengths or some of your weaknesses. What do you wanna learn in this position? Um, why, and why do you want this position? And then another one I found is tell me about yourself. And this can be one of the hardest ones to answer. What they're generally looking for when they say tell me about yourself is they're kind of opening the door for you to talk about the things you think are important for them to know. So this would be a good time to kind of go over your experience, go over the skills you have, and really emphasize the things that you think are most important about yourself. You know, I've been in CAP so many years. I've done these positions. I've experienced in these things. So that's, that's kind of what we're looking for. Um, try to you know, omit things that don't really apply to why you're having the interview. I don't need to know you have two cats and a dog. That is not gonna help me decide if I should pick you for the staff position. So that sort of things I would keep out. Prepare questions to ask back. This is so huge and so many cadets miss this part of the interview. You wanna ask them questions back and it will make you look like a better candidate. Some examples of those are, you know, what sort of work will I be doing in this position? And again, as I emphasized earlier, make sure these are questions that you shouldn't know, like you don't know the answer to and that they haven't already provided you the information for. If you come to an interview and you look at me and go, oh, what work am I gonna be doing in this position? And I've already sent out a position description, I'm gonna be kind of disappointed because that shows you didn't read that position description. But if you come to me and say, hey, in the position description, it said I'd be doing this thing, what exactly is that gonna look like? Then I've known you've read the staff position and I can start to emphasize those things that you wanna know. Some other examples are, what might be one of my biggest challenges in this position? What are some of my opportunities for growth? And then another kind of fun one to ask is, what is either the values of a company or the values of the individual? So if you're in an interview and you know the person is the commander of the activity, it might be worth asking them, what are some of your values? because it gives you kind of idea of what they're looking for and what they value as an individual. 
Another big thing to practice is off the cuff questions. You will get asked at least one of these in the staff interview. And what these are is we will probably throw a question at you that may or may not make much sense. And we're just trying to catch you off guard. The reasoning is we wanna see how you handle that stressful situation. Staff interviews are definitely already stressful enough, but we will throw one of those in there. The easiest way to practice these is to get a friend or family member to ask you a random question at some point throughout the day. And you just have to be prepared to answer back. Now, let's say they throw one at you and you don't know the answer. Don't fake it. Don't pretend you do. Don't throw out stuff you don't know. This is a great time to be like, I, I honestly don't know. That shows you have integrity and honesty, and it's better than if you just try to throw out information. The other option you have is, I'll get back to you. I'll look it up. I'll, you know, they ask you something about something, a training you put on there, you know, what, who taught it or whatever, and you don't remember who the instructor was. You can say, hey, I honestly don't know, but I'll contact the people and I'll get back to you and I'll get you the name of the instructor. If you do say that though, you have to make sure you follow through. So if you tell me you're going to get me information, make sure you actually get it and then make sure you get it to me. Lastly, stay calm. I can't emphasize this enough. Staff interviews are nerve wracking. I understand, I've been there. But super important to stay calm. Make sure you're breathing. Make sure that you, um, you know, trying your best to stay calm. And do know that most experts have found that the interviewer is oftentimes just as nervous as the interviewee. So if you find yourself thinking, man, I, I can't believe I'm this nervous. Know that the other person is probably just as nervous. So. You're not alone. All right, some last tips and tricks before I wrap this up. Bring a copy of your cover letter and resume. When you get to a staff interview, oftentimes they will have a copy, but I've done some where I've had a stack of cover letters and resumes that I've had to have to interview people. And sometimes it can be hard to find the specific one I need right away. Whereas if you come in and you just drag it out and be like, yeah, here, right here, I said this thing that you're referencing. That shows me that you're prepared, that you have it, and that you know what's in it. And you could just bring it in like a little file folder or something. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but I'd bring it with you. Take notes. This is huge. Um, it's something that a lot of interviewers look for, and they don't have to be fancy notes. They don't have to be very detailed notes, but they need to be stuff that you can read and you can refer back to later. So bring a notepad, bring a pen, and if they mention something and you find yourself thinking, oh, that's probably important, write it down. If they give you feedback, write it down. If they ask you to do something, write it down. And when you ask questions, write down notes on their responses. Show that you actually do care to know the answers and you're not just asking them because someone told you to. Like I said, prepare questions. Ask them questions. This is a huge thing that gets missed. It's super important, ask them questions. Prepare answers to the questions they might ask you. Along those lines, prepare to answer the questions that you that you may get asked that you didn't prepare for off the cuff questions. And again, like I said, my favorite way to prepare for that is to get a friend to just ask me random questions. And they don't necessarily have to be interview questions. They can be as simple as, tell me your favorite color. And you just have to, on the spot, give an answer. And you may be sitting there thinking, oh, I don't know blue. But it's it's good to practice thinking critically through a stressful situation like that. And lastly, don't forget your call to action at the end. As I said, I've been in too many interviews where I've said, all right, you may leave. And they go, okay, thank you. And out they go. You wanna not only thank them, but you also wanna make sure that you remind them that you're expecting to hear back from them or you're expecting a follow-up so that you know that they haven't just forgotten about you. This can be, I look forward to hearing from you. This can be, I'll complete that thing you assigned me. This can be any form of that. And if you can, I, again, would try, try to set a date. You know, I look forward to hearing from you by the 28th of February or whenever you guys decide. Give them, you know, give them a few weeks if they need stuff to process, but make sure. And then if you don't hear back from them by that date, follow up. They may have missed something they may have forgotten. And this shows that you are paying attention and you really do want that position. So with that, that wraps up my presentation on uh, staff interviews, I'm going to open for quick questions, and then I will turn it over to our guest speaker. Does anyone have any quick questions on staff interviews or resumes?
All right, not hearing any. I'm going to turn it over to Captain Cobb so he can do his yeah. presentation on Major Sparks. <clears throat> yes, Colonel Gorm. Uh, could that second Lieutenant Roberts had a question? Oh, go ahead. Um, about the first impression, you talked about it in person. How do you think you would make a good first impression on Zoom or perhaps in like a online format? Okay, so online is fairly similar to in person. You want to make sure you look professional. If you're going to be in uniform, make sure it's pressed because you're still going to be able to see the top half of you. Make sure your hair is professional. And then I would make sure your background is professional. You know, you don't want stuff in the background that might give me a negative impression of you. And then again, the first thing you're going to do is kind of those pleasantries. So make sure that if they say, hey, how are you, that you ask them back and that you pay attention, that sort of idea. So it's fairly similar to in person. Any other quick questions? All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Captain Cobb so he can give his presentation on specifically encampment applications. And then we will have some time for more questions at the end. All right, guys. Um, my name is Cadet Captain Cobb. I'm going to be presenting on encampment applications here. Can, I, can everyone see that? Are we good? All right, wonderful. So. Um, a little bit about me, I was selected to be the Winter Raptor 5 Cadet Commander. Um, that was supposed to happen over winter break. Obviously it didn't because of COVID restrictions, um, but I still got to look over <laughs> a fair number of encampment staff applications. So I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about why encampment is different, um, how to build a cover letter and a resume specifically for encampment, how to ace CSX and demystifying a little bit of what exec is looking for. Um, so how many of you are here because you're looking to be on squadron staff or above? All right, uh, flight staff, anyone? Cool, support. All right, um, anyone because it was the last thing that fit in your schedule? All right, cool. Well, moving on with that, um, why is encampment different? It's different because we're looking for the next generation of leaders. Um, we want to know that you're knowledgeable, that you're committed, uh, that you're willing to work hard for your students, and that you're willing to learn as you go. Uh, you will make the biggest impression on your students over the course of the week. So we wanna make sure that you have all of the tools necessary to succeed. So how do you do that? Number one, you look out for uh, the encampment cadre application memorandums. This is one from Cascade Falcon 24. Um, this was the last Cascade Falcon that actually happened. So you'll see all of the dates and everything you need to know to apply for a certain staff position on one of these memorandums. Once you've decided that you want to apply, you're gonna to need to write a cover letter and a resume. This is a cover letter that I submitted for Cascade Falcon 23. You've already gotten some good information about uh, cover letters and resumes, so I'm not gonna to go too far into it, but basically explain why you wanna serve, not just what makes you a good fit. Uh, and relate your resume experience to your current position that you're applying for. How will you teach at encampment? Do you have specific skills that make you a good fit? Are you flexible? Do you know the six step teaching method? Things like that. Um, and put passion into your cover letter, make it sound good. I'm, remember, exec is gonna be reading through tons of these. And if you're just like, well, I wanna be a flight sergeant because I think I would be a good fit cool, you're telling us what you wanna do, but if you don't put passion into it, if you don't say, I wanna do this, I wanna be capable, I wanna be confident, I wanna be committed and I wanna teach my students, exec is gonna be like, all right. But if you bring passion into it, they're gonna be like, I want this guy. He sounds like he knows what he's talking about. So this is a sample resume that I've submitted. Um, again, you've seen some good resumes during this presentation, but it should be short and it should be readable. This, you can see exactly what I've done. I have bullet points explaining it. I have dates versus this one. 
where it shows what I've done and I have dates, but you have to really figure out exactly what I've done and you have to go through it line by line. And if I were hiring me with this resume, I wouldn't be hired because I can't tell what I'm supposed to be doing. So if you don't have experience in Civil Air Patrol, you can put things from school. Uh, you can put things from your extracurricular activities, but make sure that it looks like that and not like this. All right, so CSX. CSX is the Cadre Selection Exercise. That's the acronym that California Wing uses. Cascade Falcon also does a CSX. Uh, this is Captain Weir interviewing a potential candidate for Cascade Falcon 25, which unfortunately didn't happen. Um, but general tips to ace CSX, make sure you brush up on your drill. Make sure that you've read all of the pertinent information about drill because we'll definitely be testing you on that. Make sure that your uniform looks pressed, looks good. If you have a bunch of cadets going in one van to CSX, then while you're on the ride, you know, look over each other's uniforms, make sure that you snip any bomb cords, anything like that. Be prepared for situation questions. Um, a lot of the time we're not looking for what's your knowledge like on this subject. I'm sure that you know a lot about rockets, but how will you actually teach a column right to your cadets when your flight sergeant is nowhere to be found and you have 15 minutes until the next activity starts. We want to make sure that you can think on your feet, that you can do a lot with the knowledge that you actually have. And remember, not all interviewers are created equal. Like Major Sparks was saying, sometimes we're as scared as you are. So explain your answers clearly and don't be afraid to elaborate. Just make sure you don't ramble. You can say, yes, my current experience with this position makes me a good candidate for that position, and here's why. But if you go on a long rambling story of how, you know, maybe at AFI you didn't do this right, and so now you, you're already bored, and the interviewer is bored as well. That's going to get you nowhere, so make sure you're concise and be confident. You know, everyone is scared, everyone wants the position. But if you're confident, you can convince your interviewer that the sky is green and they're not going to know the difference. So make sure that you have self-confidence. You'll be able to ace yet sex. Then finally, I want to talk about demystifying what exec is looking for. This is the executive cadre for Cascade Falcon 24. Um, and I was extremely confused about why I got staff positions at Cascade Falcon. I'm a California wing cadet. They don't really know me. Why were they hiring me? Like, don't get me wrong, I was happy, but I was so confused. So I wanna share with you a little bit about what we're looking for. Um, generally, we look over everyone's cover letter, exec and the squadron commanders. Um, your reputation, your experience, and your image all count. Make sure that you're professional when you're presenting yourself to CSX or whatever other activities you attend, because we will be remembering you from certain activities. And as well as your experience listed on your resume and your cover letter, we want to know how you perform in environments. So we'll be taking that into account. Um, we consider everyone for each position that they applied for. It's based on the application package. That's your resume, your cover letter, and any Google forms that we have you fill out, um, as well as your CSX experience. So really what it comes down to is a lot of color-coded spreadsheets. Um, that's how we organize everything. This is for Winter Raptor 5. Um, but we're looking for a lot of things, what I just mentioned. But don't be scared because you don't know what we're looking for. Um, everyone is graded on the same basis. So finally, um, this is <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Gorham and his squadron at Cascade Falcon 24. I've put my email up here if you have any questions. Uh, again, I talked to you about why encampment is different, um, how to build a cover letter and a resume, how to ace CSX, and just a little bit of what executive cadre is looking for.
If you have any questions for me, feel free to reach out on that email. I can answer short questions right now, but I know you guys have a schedule you want to keep. So uh, yeah, thanks for letting me crash your WAMA class. Thank you, Captain Cobb. So yeah, for our last kind of 15-ish minutes, I'd like to open the floor for questions. These can be questions on anything we've talked about, cover letters, resumes, staff interviews. If you guys have any questions for Captain Cobb, he is here. You are more than welcome to ask him questions about encampment applications. So yeah, I'm just gonna open the floor, questions. This is Colonel Maxwell with a comment. Go ahead, Colonel Maxwell. So I just want to, am I right that they can still apply for Cascade Falcon current 25 um, till the end of the month, till the end of February? Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Until the 28th is what the memorandum says. I have another comment to build on a com that what uh, Captain Cobb said. This is Colonel Wiggs. <clears throat> the interviews and interviewers do take into account what they've seen you do at other activities. As your CAP career continues, your CAP reputation builds and follows you. Everybody has a stumble here and there, and they can be overcome and uh, improved. But just keep in that mind that these events are not isolated silos. In a previous class, we talked about your connections in other areas or units. And Captain Cobb is an example of those connections that have been made. He is visiting us from California. We've had presenters and participants actually in some of our uh, virtual WAMAs from, I believe as far away as Tennessee, if memory serves, but from all over the country, you get these connections. And some of our staff have gone and staffed encampments and activities in other states as well, whether it's Winter Raptor in uh, Oregon or the Georgia encampments and Idaho, et cetera. So, there's a lot to that. As a manager for many years and having done more, my apologies, I was, my camera was off. I've done more interviews than I care to um, count, but what the cadet presenters have said ring very, very true. As a seasoned manager, I wish a lot of prospective employees that I've interviewed over the years had taken this class. It would have saved their time and my time um, and been much more effective. So kudos to all of you. And if you have questions, feel free to hit them with it and learn. They're spot on from my perspective. Any other questions? Another comment, if I may, ma'am. Absolutely, go ahead, Colonel Gore. Awesome, so if you're looking to staff an encampment or if you wanna apply for a bunch of the other wing activities um, and you put together your resume and it's the best that you have and you notice that it's not quite as much stuff you think and maybe it's a really competitive position like flight commander at encampment or something like that, and you wanna try and make yourself a little bit more competitive, um, they are looking at your resume and your experience around the wing. So going to events outside of your squadron level is really important. Getting to form those connections, like going to WAMA is really important because there's what, like 20 people on here? And we're gonna remember the faces of the people who show up to WAMA. If you want to volunteer to teach a class here at WAMA, we have classes next month that we are looking for instructors for. That is a awesome opportunity for you to be able to build some experience to get to know some people from across the wing go to outside activities maybe show up to another squadrons meeting if that's something you want to do just get your face out there 
Um, and then the other thing you can do is ask your leadership for feedback. After you do the cadre selection exercise, they go through all these cadets and they might not be able to provide you with feedback. But maybe after the event is over, pull aside one of the people and say, hey, how did I do on my interview? How did I do on my uniform inspection? Is there any feedback you can provide me to do a little bit better? Because they see like 50 faces at cadre selection exercise. But then if they have that one person who sticks around afterwards who says, hey, can I, um, is there anything I can do to make myself even better? They'll remember your face. They remember this cadet who came and asked for feedback, not just so that you can get better, but they remember you. So that way, when they're looking and making those cadre decisions on who do they want to hire, they remember that, hey, this person wanted to improve themselves. They asked for feedback and that'll really help you out. So just trying to make those connections at different wing level activities, go outside a wing, just try and get yourself out there as much as possible, be an instructor and really asking for that feedback can really help you if you want to further yourself as a competitive applicant for some of these positions. And to add what Coronel Gorham was saying, um, from my personal experience, and I'm going to pick on one cadet because I know she's from my squadron, Sergeant Riccio knows very well that I have always put myself out to all the cadets in my squadron as someone they can come to if they want help on applications. And I've had many cadets take advantage of that. And I highly, highly recommend if there's someone in your squadron, take advantage of it. If there's not, reach out to me. Um, I can catch a lot of things before you send the application in so that you don't have to worry about them getting caught later on. And it's important to find the people in your squadron who have that experience and listen to them and learn from them because chances are a lot of the stuff I've been through, I've made some mistakes and I can teach you those things now so that you don't have to go through them later. So if you do know someone who has the experience, reach out, get that help, and maybe even they'll be willing to practice an interview with you. If you're really nervous about doing an interview, talk to them. I'd be more than happy to role play an interview with anyone, whether it's virtual or in person. So, and I'll, I'll go ahead and drop my information in the chat as well. I see everyone else is doing that. Um, are there any more questions? We have a few minutes left. Oh, ma'am, I have a question. So when you were talking about if you're in an interview with somebody and then let's say they ask you a question that you don't know about, uh, when do you recommend that you'd reach out to tell them when you like found out the information? Like when would be considered too long? Uh, would you recommend like the day after? Something like that? So, okay, so see if, let's see if I get this correct. So they asked you a question, you didn't know the information. And so you said, I'll get back to you. Is that kind of what you're asking? Okay, perfect. Yes, ma'am. So in this situation, I would try and get the information to them as soon as possible. If you're gonna be emailing it to them, that's generally the best option because then they can get it whenever they have a chance. You know, it can go in their inbox and they can look at it whenever they get a chance. So I try and get back to them as soon as possible. Um, if it does end up being something you can't really get, you know, say you're trying to get a hold of someone and they're just not responding, I'd send them an email probably within the first you know, week or so and say, hey, I've reached out. I can't get the information. I will get it to you as soon as I get it if I can. And just you know, reiterate that you are working on it so they know that you didn't just, oh, I'll get that for you and then didn't do anything. So that sort of idea. Um, yeah, so that's kind of it kind of depends on what the information is and what you're trying to get. So that sort of idea. And, and don't be afraid to, for everyone, don't be afraid to say, I don't know, or I'll get back to you. There, there are times that happens. People ask for things and you're like, oh, I didn't expect that, or I would have brought it, or I would have looked it up. So it's completely okay to say that. And it's better to say that than to lie or to make something up or to pretend that you know something you don't. As I said earlier, experts are finding this is on the rise and that's not good because we will find it out. And then your reputation is tainted and then you're way less likely to get the position. Any other questions?
All right, well, if we don't have anything else, um, thank you very much to our presenters, Major Sparks, Lieutenant Booz, and Captain Cobb. Um, if you have any uh, further questions, they put their email addresses in the chat, so you can go ahead and reach out to them afterwards, and they'd be happy to answer any other questions that you may have. Um, at this time, Colonel Wiggs has a poll for you to be able to fill out to just for a little bit of our benefit so we can see how you enjoyed the class and any feedback that we can have in the future. If you have any other ideas for uh, classes you'd like to see at WAMA, definitely we would appreciate those suggestions as well. And we'll see if we can put those um, on our WAMA schedule here in the future. Well, fortunately for the class, apparently my poll has crumped. So you're off the hook for this one. Um, so quick, quick visual, thumbs up or thumbs down on the class. Okay, it's okay to do that or even that, but I like that. All right. Oh, a double thumbs up. Thank you. I do apologize for the, the poll crumping. I was uh, tweaking it a few minutes ago and apparently I accidentally <clears throat> over tweaked it. <laughs> so my apologies. With that note, I am going to end the recording and let Colonel Gorham complete the closeout.